Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the virtual art talk today. We're excited to get started. Uh, we are going to give it just a couple of minutes to let everyone get logged in. We have about 40 people in already. Um, and uh, just give us a minute as uh, as people are getting getting into the uh, into the webinar. Uh, and uh, we're excited to have you today. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to start our virtual art talk in just about one minute. We're just making sure everyone can get logged in. OK. Good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's Heard Museum continuing series of virtual art talks. My name is Dan Haggerty. Uh, I work here at the Heard Museum, and I'm very, very uh, excited to welcome you today as we launch our new season of this online discussion series with an artist talk that's centered on the Heard's original exhibition, Arriving Forever into the Present World. Uh, I want to thank, uh, express my thanks uh, and welcome to the exhibition curator, Velma Key Craig, for joining us today uh, and for moderating the discussion that we'll be having. And also, of course, to our artist guests, Terrell Dew Johnson and Alice Wilsey, for joining us today to share about their work. Programs like the one we're about to enjoy are made possible thanks to the support that we receive from Heard Museum members. If you're not a member, we hope you'll join us. When you do, you get a lot of benefits, including free admission to the museum every day and a 10% discount in the museum shop. And if you're online watching now and you're a member, I wanna invite you to save the date uh, for a special upcoming members only holiday party on December 20th, uh, where you will enjoy a lot of special treats and insights into the museum. And of course the museum shop will be open so you can enjoy, do some of that uh, last minute uh, holiday shopping with your museum discount. That's December 20th. And you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. Uh, another program of note that's free and open to everyone in the public, I invite you to go online to the herd uh, to herd.org events, where you can register to attend a preview screening of season two of PBS's Native America on Tuesday, October 17th. That's going to be here at the Herd Museum. We're doing this in partnership with Arizona PBS, and the screening will be followed by a discussion with producer Daniel Golding and uh, the director of the Navajo Nation Museum, Manny Wheeler. Um, this program, again, is free to the public, uh, but registration is required. So uh, you can do that from our event page. Again, go to herd.org slash events, and you can find the upcoming screening and just register online that way. And we hope to see you there next Tuesday. So before I introduce our program and our moderator today, I just want to share a few housekeeping notes with our viewers. Uh, today's program is a webinar, so you're only going to see the screens and faces of our presenters. You won't see the fellow attendees. If you'd like to pose a question for our artists or anyone on the panel, please write your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A. Uh, we may not be able to answer every question, but we will do our best to, to pose them uh, at the end of today's discussion. And finally, uh, captioning is turned on. Uh, so if you'd like to use closed captions, just turn them on with the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Arriving Forever into the Present World features works from the Heard Museum's permanent collection, including textiles, pottery, and basketry, uh, representing living artistic traditions within Southwestern indigenous cultures. Curated by Velma Key Craig, the exhibition seeks to frustrate prevailing conversations around what makes a work of art contemporary. It's my pleasure now to introduce Heard Museum Assistant Curator Velma Key Craig. Velma is the Assistant Curator at the Heard Museum and a graduate of Arizona State University with a BA in English Literature and a minor in American Indian Studies. Currently studying to receive her MA in Art History, Velma is a past Andrew W. Mellon Fellow at the Heard Museum. She's a textile artist and teaches Dene weaving and workshops and 
with numerous organizations across Phoenix, including the Herd Museum. She has co-curated numerous exhibitions at the Herd, including Substance of Stars, Heinalu, All at Once, Color Riot, and Toward the Morning Sun, and has been a co-author uh, with the accompanying publications. It's my pleasure to welcome Velma Key Craig. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Terrell Dew Johnson. Terrell Dew Johnson is a community leader, nationally recognized advocate for Native communities and renowned artist. A gifted weaver from a young age, Johnson has received national acclaim for creating abstract constructions that transcend familiar forms and materials in a way that both honors and reflects a long established practice. Johnson's intention to champion novel approaches to reestablish cultural tra traditions informs every aspect of his life and led him to found Toka, Tahona Autumn Community Action, an organization that advocates for a healthy and vital tribal community and the Poncho Farm, focused on teaching Autumn tribal members traditional farming techniques, food preparation, and wild harvesting. His artwork has won numerous awards and resides in permanent collections of many national museums, including the Herd Museum. Um, Terrell will be joined later on in the program by um, his collaborator on some of his projects, Alice Wilsey. Alice Wilsey is an artist and architectural designer from Tucson. She joined Aranda Lash in 2016 and has since worked closely with Terrell in the design and fabrication of all of their collaborative projects. Beginning in 2006, at the scale of the object, Terrell Du Johnson and Aranda Lash made a collection of baskets and experimental woven constructions that highlight parallels between craft, design, and architecture through digital and analog algorithmic processes um, by hand and on the computer and different methods of knowledge sharing. Um, so we will hear more about some of those collaborative pieces um, a little later on in the presentation, but um, for now, Please welcome Terrell Dew Johnson. Terrell. Maybe we'll welcome Alice Wilsey a little earlier than expected. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. Hi, Terrell. Hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. I just was um, um, trying to do this Zoom thingy. Um, can you see me? Or can you see the slides? Just let's see. So right now we see your slides, and uh, just if you if you're able to turn your camera on, we would see your your face as well. But we can hear you. Asked to start your video. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um. Let me um. Let me show you what I look like. Um. Okay. I guess. Oh, there we go. Um. So hi everybody. Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna wear my sunglasses. I'm driving up to Tucson, but um, I'm 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 so excited to talk to you and to uh, talk to you in this manner. Um, it, it's it's kind of new for me. I love just talking, you know, to crowds in person. So this is going to be a little, a little, um, uh, probably a little harder or easier. I don't know. I usually um, rely on the group to give me uh, uh, little cues and feedback. So, but um, yeah, this is this is me without the sunglasses. So let's start this um, presentation. Um, I think we had a title for the presentation. Um, I think it was um, of uh, having of um, Vella. Do you have that? 
Yeah, the title of the presentation is Weaving Magic with Fiber. Yes, okay. Weaving Magic with Fiber. So I usually like to start out with the, um, the, the first picture of um, women, uh, an old photo. I'm not sure how old it is, but it's old women um, depicting with um, a younger woman weaving baskets and um, you know this their basket weaving it's amazing the big woven pieces that they're doing and of course this is a picture that's been set set up because no weaver will be sitting in direct sunlight they'll be usually sitting under the ramada that's behind them but um, it's, it's a perfect picture that I I love to start off with. Next. So um, next slide. So the next slide is more of a collage of all the basket weavers, men, women, elderly, um, you know, that, that, um, that weave. And for a very long time, weaving was considered a woman's, woman's job. And so um, they would usually say, well, why come men are doing it now? You know, and I was asked that question when I first started. And my teacher would say, well, it doesn't really matter who's doing it now, as long as they're doing it. Because she felt that the art of weaving baskets was dying. So we got uh, men in this picture. Uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph, but uh, that means um, when they say but, it means that uh, they've passed on. So Joseph, but, and a few others that, that, um, that I know have gone. I don't know if you noticed the picture with the, the, the elder woman carrying two baskets. Uh, she is um, one of the uh, Josephine, um, Josephine, I forgot her last name, but she was weaving and still at the age of um, 1991. And this is, uh, you know, she was 91 when I took this picture and she still was weaving. She was in her basket and weren't as tight or stitchy wasn't to even like she used to be but you know she's always done it taught her family her family are weavers and she just you know said I, I still can do this you know so that's Josephine but next slide So this is me. Um, I think I was 18 or 19. I had just gotten back from school. I went to school overseas um, in Australia, and I just got back and wanted to get back into weaving. So this, this is Clara. Um, and Clara was a, a well-known basket weaver. Uh, she was well known for making all sorts of baskets, and uh, she heard about me, so she sought me out, and I was at my grandparents' home. And she came with a a bundle of yucca and a devil's claw, and she said, um, "You know, I think I was still asleep." So she talked to my grandmother, and she said, "Tell him if he can make me a basket." I got a basket order for an owl, and I can't weave owls no more. Her hands aren't like they used to be. So she heard that I make really good owls. And so she, again, looked for me and found me and gave all the material to my grandmother. And so when I woke up, you know, she said, here, this is for you. Uh, this Clara uh, lady dropped it by and wants you to make a black and white owl. 
And so I said, yeah, sure. You know, and that's all I did um, was weave because I was done with school. And so um, I sat there for about a week or so and just worked mainly on this owl that Clara is holding. Um, if you can see that. Um, yeah. And so Carol, uh, um, I did, actually, yes. Um, did you weave the basket that you're holding as well or just the owl? Uh, I wove both of them. So the one I'm holding is a squash blossom. And the one that Clara's holding is a um, an owl, the owl basket that she wanted me to weave. And I came to deliver it to her, but I also showed her this one other basket that I, I finished a while ago, and that was the squash blossom. Um, and Clara Butt was, um, was amazed, and she actually would ask me to come over. So one summer I spent maybe like every day with her, with my grandparents, because Clara only spoke awesome and I didn't speak awesome. So my grandmother or grandfather was my translator. And so we just talked all summer and told me stories. She saw, she told me different techniques, um, the stories that went with the baskets and the designs and just talked about, you know, about life, you know, growing up and, and be respectful, and when you pick your yucca, you know, this is what you do. So I learned a lot from Clara, but, so next slide. Um, this is an example of what you can do with basketry. Um, this basket here is from Sadie Butt. Sadie Marks uh, was Hopi, and she got married to a author. And so they met during the, uh, the PI school there, the Indian, fin fin um, Indian school in um, Phoenix. And that's where they met because there, you know, they had dorms and they had all, all different tribes there. So she fell in love with Homer, her husband, but, and they um, moved to his village, Santa Rosa, where Sadie actually was taught how to make baskets through her mother-in-law. But Sadie wanted to be different and show off a lot of her, the Hopi designs and the colors and, and her own um, style. So that, that piece we're looking at here is one of the most well-known styles that she does. And she adds in Hopi um, material and colors. And, um, you know, I, as a weaver, I really respect her and I really miss her. She was one of the first to go when COVID hit and she got in COVID so she passed away. So I really miss her. She was a good friend of mine. And we used to go to Joe's and drive her all over the Southwest trying to make all the shows. So she was a really good um, driving partner as well. So, all right, let's go to the next slide. So this is a collage of the different <laughs> types of baskets that weavers have done. <laughs> Yeah, um, you got a snake basket there that was done by um, Christine Butt. She um, passed away a year ago, um, but she was well known for making the little people that dance around the snake. Um, and they call you should call these friendship baskets. But again, she also was one of the brave ones to make a snake design. Because the, 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 the folklore is if you make snakes during the summer, the snakes will hear you because they're not hibernating. So the snakes will come and, and bite you. So 
Iowa's was taught to make animal figures during the winter when their hibernation is sleeping so they can't hear us talk about them. So that's one of the scenes. The other ones are done by um, GPS signal lost. By um, uh, I, I, uh, I'm, um, I'm sorry, I forgot their names. But they were very good at weaving bowls and um, plates. And you can see their work there. Um, they were just, I'm, I'm a lot of amazing baskets went through my hands when we had the gallery. And this is something that we um, are really happy because we got to see all these amazing baskets. You know, you see on the bottom left side, or yeah, of the figurines. And those are hard to do because you're working with several pieces. The legs are woven separately, the body's woven separately, and then the head's woven separately. And then when it's done, you got to sew those things all together. So just the the the, the precise um, inches to make it stand on its own and to level it and level it out is is just an amazing um, gift that they got to do. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, this is my work. This is the work that I done earlier, and thank God someone told me take pictures of your work. So we started taking pictures of our our work, and these are Polaroid cameras because that was the only camera we had. So these are actually the first of some of my my designs that I've done over the years. Um, you can see that a lot of them are um, traditional. The one on the right side up was a fret design, and we were trying to be creative. So I threw my mother's um, crocheting blanket on the back, hoping that people will be interested in her crochet work. But all they saw were the baskets. Um, also, you can see some of the contemporary old styles that were done way long You're before fine. I did. And so um, you got a basket on the right um, top there. Um, I call it the Black Widow because it's a basket that has a hole in it. And I wove a, a, a widow, a Black Widow on another basket and I, I, I put that in the hole and made it um, look like it was coming out of its, 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 its nest hole or whatever. So, so these are the pieces that I've done earlier in my career. Let's do the next slide. Um, so um, I've been very lucky to work with so many weavers and became good friends with them and learned a lot of their secrets and tips. And so we went to this fiber gathering in Santa Fe and some guy asked us if we can take a picture for him for a calendar. And so here we're sitting on the side overlooking Santa Fe um, with some weavers. Uh, we have uh, Rose Martin, we have Geneva, myself, and uh, I think that's it, yeah, and Sadie. And so these are all our baskets that that we had for this, this show. So you can see the work that has been done. All right, next slide. So, you know, what we do as a group of basket weavers, we go out and we actually provide um, transportation and lunch for the weavers that don't have transportation to go out and um, harvest yucca or beer grass. 
So we provide that as an organization. We help them do that. And they they definitely appreciate that. And they definitely love the company. And, you know, it's really fun to see weavers run to yaka, um, yaka trees and pick yaka out in the desert. So let's go to the next one. Um, again, this is just a, another picture of how many weavers we take out along with all that yucca, the white bundles that you see on the floor. We try to clean them in the space that we're at. It's just, I just think it's a little bit really um, like an environmental thing where we're leaving the fibers there to go back into the earth and, um, you know, give the fertilizers and break down and end up where it was. So we try to do that. So we're there trying to clean the yucca. Next, next slide. So um, this is just a collage of um, some of the classes that I've done. And so you see my students, but you also see a picture of my teacher, Margaret um, Acosta. And her, um, her picture is on the right upper corner, weavy. But next to her is my mother, Betty, in the middle. Um, she made her very first basket in my class. And you know, it was it was an interesting class. You know, she was my mother, yet she was my student. So I had to tell her what to do and do this and that. And, you know, I, I, it just was weird, but she took the class. This is one of her very first baskets. So we'll go to the next slide. So then uh, the contemporary work just happened and started and this is one of the pieces that I think this Smithsonian actually just acquired and I call it Penny for Your Thoughts because every time I did a demonstration or did a show everybody will ask you know how long did it take you to make the best how long did it take you to make the best so I say if I had a penny for every time I was asked that um, I'd be a rich guy so I came up with this piece called Pennies for Your Thoughts, uh, just because you know, these questions that always have been answered. And when the Smithsonian required this, they called me up and they were asking me questions about, well, how many pennies are on there? Or how did you clean the penny? He said, I told them, I don't know how many pennies I put in there. You're welcome to count them, but um, also what I used was a trouble um, to clean them, each of the pennies, with a soft um, cloth of trouble bit. And that's how I got them shiny. And some I shined, some aren't, just to get that kind of glimmery look. So, um, but this is one of my pieces that I've done. And the shape of the basket, for a very long time, I was making baskets like this, like faces. And I was actually inspired. I, I think I did the Hearst show and I sat by this potter who made basket um, pottery like that. So I really, during the day, was just um, looking at her shape of her, her pots and um, said, I can do that. So I did it. And. And I started embellishing them with, with so let's go to the next slide. Um, this is one board piece that I've done. And the board piece that I've done actually was by accident. I was asked to take part in the Native American indigenous um, gallery in San Francisco. And I said, sure. So I was working on a piece, but it broke. 
And so I was panicking, trying to figure out, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I had some corners that I just got from my mother who finished making tamales and this with the leftovers. So I took the fibers and stripped them, and uh, I started weaving. And you'll see that picture later. But um, um, it evolved that first night evolved into making baskets like this. So we go to the next slide. So the basket that's on the very right, on the left, upper side, is the, the corn that I broke. So I had to cut it, drill holes in it, and then you can see the white, which is um, corn husks. And I love the way that corn husks was flowing with the dips and cutting, and I oh, I can actually control the way the fire was laid. So then I started making them, and I, I, this piece right here, the large piece, was around, oh, I would say about almost 25, 30 inches wide and about the same, about maybe 25 inches wide. And I made this and, you know, it just had so many dips in it and separating the stitches. Um, this was the uh, results. And those are one of my, my, that was one of my pieces that I love doing. All right, next slide. Again, you know, the, the open weaving stitches really took off so I started doing different things like casting them in bronze and things like that so this is one that was cast in a, in a bronze and I think this piece is actually in the permanent display at the Smithsonian Indian Museum in New York um, the second piece next to it is a, is a piece called Touched by Many. And it's because when we were doing the show for the Smithsonian, I was working with several different weavers that came from Maine, came from Washington, uh, came from uh, Michigan, California. And then they asked me to sort of make up a basket that sort of represents the show. So I was thinking, how am I going to do that? Um, so I finally thought of my grandmother who made quilts. She would save the clothes that got holes in there and baby clothes that she made and other things. And there were just different color panels. So I thought, oh, I could make a quilt basket. So I actually borrowed, well, actually, I was um, I was asking weavers to give me their leftovers from their pieces, and they gave me this. So this piece uh, has um, um, brown, uh, um, brown ash from Maine. It has cedar bark from Washington. Um, red bud um, and tule from California, and then this long, long piece. There is actually a warrior's belt that I weaved when I did a residency in um, New Zealand. So uh, these pieces all were done separately, then then put together like this, and I thought that represented the show very well. Okay, next piece. So then I met these guys down there, around the lash. I met them and I think they came to one of my lectures I did in New York. And so um, they um, approached me and said, hey, you know, we like what you're doing and we would love to work with you because you seem to be not scared of doing different things. So I was like, I don't know. You know, I don't even know what algorithms are or 
things like that. And so they explained. And so I was a little leery, but then I thought, well, I'll give it a chance. So you see the little drawing looks up there. And I gave it to them. I said, let's see what you can do with this shape. What kind of basket do you think you can do with this shape? So they went back and did renderings and um, things. So these blue and brown or gray pieces were rendering in the computer that they did with algorithms and different formulas to to get the design in the computer. Um, next slide. Hi, Terrell. I just um, wanted to let you know that we're at the 10 minute mark. Okay. Well, this is the result of it. So this is actually called um, form over function. So as a basket that contains things, it's not, it's just, it's just a, a form, but it's not very functional, it's art. And so let's go to the next slide. So you see the different styles I've done uh, over the years with the bark and the collaborations. Next slide. Um, this was my favorite. It's called um, conversing. It reminds me of my hands at a party, and my hands usually get together and they gossip about people and talk about people. So they're always looking around and see if they're listening. And so these baskets represent my hands at the corner gossiping. Next slide. Um, this um, are metal pieces. Um, called endless knots, and I incorporated fibers from the desert. Um, the the one on the right is um, creosote. Next slide. Um, this is the one that's in the show. This is one of my biggest pieces. Uh, one of my most painful pieces that I did. I say painful because. It was so big, my arms would stretch out and I would have to be weaving. And I was like pulling so hard to get it tight and get it really precise. And, you know, I, I worked on this for a long time, but that's, it took me a long time to put the panels together, sew everything up, line the panels, and then work on the weaving part. So, but this is the result of all that hard work. And you can see this live at the exhibit at the Heard Museum. Next slide. Again, examples of my collaboration with Aranda Lash. And this, I'll bring in Alice to just say a little bit about the, the collaboration and what she does. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alice Wilsey. And yeah, this is the time when I actually joined Aranda Lash. I was still in school getting my master's in architecture at the time. And I came in to work on this show with Terrell. Um, it was a big show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tucson. And there were a lot of pieces that needed to be made. So I got to work with Terrell, learning some techniques uh, to to build these and also we had to invent some new uh, weaving and construction techniques for these pieces. I think we can Next go slide. through. Yeah. So yeah. these are all pieces from that show. Next slide. This is a. Uh... The creosote. This is the bear grass. Oh, this is a uh, um, the paper um, wire basket that we made. Uh, next one, Alice. Could you talk about these? Sure. Yeah. So the wire and paper one was. I think maybe the first paper piece that Aranda Lash did with Terrell. Um, I mean, Terrell has been making paper and uh, baskets and clothing with paper for his whole career, but this was the first one we did together. 
And Terrell made this paper with yucca. Uh, this one is um, copper that's bent, like copper you would use for a refrigerator or cooling system. Um, we bent it around a form and, you know, it's big. It's like the size of a kid's bicycle or something, but we soldered it like jewelry. Next. Oh, this one is um, the crater basket. I think this is in the Hurt collection. And um, this is very interesting to make and design, but um, we did it. And this is the result of, again, our collaboration and just the weaving part of the hardest weaving part that I've done as well. Next slide. So this is our yeah yeah this is our biggest piece so far um it's about 25 feet tall and about 10 feet in the other directions it was commissioned um by uh the u.s embassy in paraguay and terrell traveled uh there and talked with uh weavers there and brought back palm fronds. So the paper is made uh, with yucca and palm fronds from Paraguay. And then the rest is just bent steel. And it took a whole crew to put yeah. this up. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just a beautiful, the biggest piece I've done. Um, and Alice was a really big help. She helped make the paper, but she also helped weld the, the, the stills together. Next slide. Yeah, so here's oh, the yucca processing. Yeah, I, I, I did um, sort of the old form of just beating the, the pulp. And you can see Alice there. We had to make a screen and our own water pool and everything. We got young people involved, young uh, young people from the community involved with it. Next slide. Um, and these are just the different stuff that made um, the big piece there, I think. Next yeah. slide. Here's us putting up the piece. You can see how big it is. All right, next slide. And there's a result. And the whole result was to have the sun hit these papers so that you can see the veins of the yucca, which is on your right side, and through that paper. And, and um, it worked out pretty good. I must say, so thank you, Alice, for, for helping. And, you know, Alice has been helping me over the years. Um, we collaborated and we're still doing that. So, you know, Alice, I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm just glad she's able to, that we found each other to work together. I rely a lot on her opinion and a lot on her skills and you know I, I, it's just a, a, with the random lash and Alice a match made in heaven all right next slide me too so this yes, is our Alice. latest collaboration we did a a whole show at the volume gallery in Chicago and this was really fun because instead of designing the finished piece and then trying to figure out how to make it, we designed a process and the finished pieces were surprises. So we incorporated materials from the desert um, and, and then draped these uh, paper forms over rocks and the, the materials really determined the shape, the texture and the color of, of all of these pieces. All right, next slide, yeah. And that's just uh, 
Oh, go ahead, Alice. Uh, yeah, well, I think we, when we were making the paper for the big um, Paraguay piece, we were thinking about other ways to use paper. Maybe we could um, form it in molds or spray it, uh, but trying to use it more three-dimensionally rather than uh, making sheets of paper and then and then forming it. So, so this was really just kind of wild experiments, um, but we were really excited with what came out of it. And so we used, yeah, big pieces of, you know, creosote, the, what looks like hair is agave fiber. Um, there's big pieces of volcanic rock, mica, um, copper, copper powder we ground and put into the paper pulp and that uh, reacted with the water and made these beautiful like turquoise colors. The creosote made all of the orange color. Uh, and then there's some pinks that are from uh, glow mallow petals. Oh yeah, next slide. Um, that's just a picture of the endless knot without the fiber sticking out. Next slide. This is um, sort of like a weird uh, 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 picture for, what was this for? Well, this uh, is just like a close up of the, this is like volcanic rock powder on a like white paper, but you can see how when it dried it, it like crackled and folded and kind of became like a bigger rock again. Yeah, um, next slide. Another close up of it. Mm -hmm. That's um, uh, mesquite bark. Uh, next slide. And this is one of the copper ones. So you uh, can see the copper color, <laughs> but then the green yeah. kind of leached out and and colored the entire piece. This is a beautiful piece. And some more examples. Next slide. Just other examples. Um, the hanging basket. Next slide. Yeah, so one of our pieces from this series was um, we entered into the Lueve uh, Craft Prize which had like over 3000 applicants and we made it as a finalist and um, one of 20. And it was shown with the other finalists at the Noguchi Museum in New York this past summer, um, which is an incredible show. If you go to their website, you can see the other finalists, really amazing work from all over the world. Yeah, next slide. And this is, uh, uh, image of that show. Uh, next slide. And this is a show that's going on right now at the MoMA and um, the pieces that they have in their permanent collection uh, from our collaboration are there. Yeah, and these pieces were, um, were, were acquired years ago that a show that I'm one of my first New York shows I did in a gallery called um, Artist Space. And so we, we were working so hard to get pieces done and things to fill our space because we had a room that we had to fill. So um, I think there's a picture. Next, next photo. Um, yeah, okay, well, yeah. So it was just of these old, um, it's on these pieces that we did that I had the core, the board pieces, other pieces. So, um, and so this is just a, a little view of what I've done and over the years and who have I collaborated with. And next slide. So what I've done is that, you know, I've done what my teachers had told me what to do was to teach what you learn. So I've been teaching ever since and taught other weavers how to teach other people. And so it's the elders that are passing 
this art of weaving to young people. Next slide. So, you know, that was me when I had hair and I was working with this young woman named Sissy Marie One, who just grew up with the program and was always in our life. And so she was learning how to weave baskets. Right now she's working with the governor. She went through college, university, became Miss Donna Autumn, then did a, a reign of Miss uh, um, Native American. Um, then uh, she did the Arizona Native American. So she's been doing a lot of great stuff. And you show us, she always um, thanks us for helping her. She says we're one of her pillars in her life. And so this is me and her and teaching her how to weep. So again, it's uh, the, the older people teaching the young people. So wonderful. This is Thank you so much, slide. Carol. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a wonderful slide to, to, to end on, and I'm so glad that you included it. Um, we have, you know, some some questions that were um, coming through as you were speaking. One of them is asking um, what wood was um, what wood was used to make the basket that was included in our exhibition. And I'll just answer that very quickly. It's on our label. Um, eucalyptus is what we have in our records um, for that one. Um, you mentioned um, that some of the names of the, the fibers that weavers are using, yucca, devil's claw, um, and bear grass. Did I miss any? Are there other fibers that weavers um, are using to weave baskets with? No, um, but that's all the fibers they use. Mm -hmm. And then some, um, another viewer is asking, what types of gourds do you use in the baskets that incorporate gourds? Um, I'm not too sure. I'm not a gourd, but um, I usually buy um, from um, the farms, and I just pick what really looks good and can stand up and. When you knock on it, you can tell when it's thick. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of them are dipper gourds, um, um, drum gourds, everything, all the kinds of gourds. This is favorite um, farm mm -hmm. in uh, California that I go to a lot. I get gourds from them. I see. Um, and then I was just interested in this endless knot, like what what draws the two of you to 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 use that as a form or to, that what does it represent to you? Um, you know, it's, well, the endless knot represents the infinity of both, you know, the art keep going on, but then it also represents like the entire, that word, you know, infinity. Um, I think that's the proper, name for it but I call it the endless knot and it's just again a, a, a structured in a way where the architects were bending so that we could nip, uh, manipulate the the shape of where the fibers would stick out and make this sort of like a, a, a headpiece of uh, a plate Indian um, feather piece but it also represents mm -hmm. the fact that um, um, the creosotes are everywhere in the desert where I'm at, but we're losing them because of housing development. So this piece, the creosote that I use in some of the pieces, the leaves would fall off and that represents the losing of this um, multi-purpose um, um, plant that is medicine that is um housing that is used to um, um bless your home and so there's many things for that with it falling apart and leaving the veins that just, that they're dying and we're not using them 
as much as we should. So that's what that piece also represents. Uh, it's a funny story when they heard purchase one of these, they were in panic because they're saying things are falling off. And I said, well, it's supposed to. But they were like mad because that stuff was everywhere. And I don't think it's ever been on display yet, but that was the purpose of it. And I told them that. So I just thought that was kind of funny that they had me come up all the way to tell them it's supposed to do that. So any more questions? Yeah. Um, there are no more questions, and I think internet is a little bit spotty in places, So, um, um, and we are at the end of our hour, but we really do appreciate you, Terrell. I, I, I admire your work so much, um, and thank you for answering our questions and showing us the collaborations that you um, and Alice and Aranda Lash are working on. Um, Dan, did you have anything else? Um, we are good. I'll speak on behalf of Dan. Thank you all very much for sharing this space. And we will be sharing the recording um, soon online if you'd like to rewatch or share with anyone. Thank you, Terrell. Thank you, Valma. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. open to that. Is everybody off? Yoo -hoo. Everybody's off. Hey, let's see. Oh. What's it called? Yeah, right there.